Super. Great. Um, yeah, um, yeah, crucial webinar. Um, Henoma, say Danina Tejar. Uh, City of Napod and Cortio Atar and Infendir. Uh, trees. Um, Wait, well, you've just muted yourself, I think, somehow. Good start. All right. Okay. I'm sorry, I muted you. It's because. Yeah, I yeah. I'm blaming you for that here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I, anyway, I'm Fees, uh, I'm Fees Evans. Uh, I work um, for the Nature Friendly Farming Network. Oh, hold on. I made an olive Gymraeg. Yeah, Fees Dwee, we're going to be tight for me or say Snapter and Gymraeg. Good twice of Fermier at the Nate soon. Good for Dick, Dorf, Sticky and Atters and Good Nows, if I go with Guis and the younger Dolph Ross Farmio soon. Sin Quarchod a Guesha around Gulch. Um, do you have the farm ever ever tailed into the mine? Yeah, Gulchia and Sir Virion. Um, so welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. We'll be looking at uh, farmland birds, how to identify them, um, uh, and talk a bit about so what you can do on your farm to to help boost uh, populations. Um, I'm Rhys Evans. Uh, I work for the Nature Friendly Farming Network in Wales. Uh, we're a network of farmers that come together to champion a way of farming that's sustainable uh, and good for nature. Um, also farm with a family myself in Rhydamaid, Yadolgallai, in Meirionid. Um, so I'm delighted to be joined by Matt Goodall, um, the Head of Education and Wales Advisor at the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, and Rian Pierce uh, from RSPB Cymru, uh, who's a farm uh, advisor, uh, who also finds herself near Sankin Havel in Denbyshire. Uh, so just to go over the running order, uh, Matt will kick things off talking about the big farmland bird count uh, and how you get involved, set a bit of sort of context as to as to why the initiative was um, introduced in the first place uh, and talk a bit about some land management advice as well. Uh, and then Rian will talk about how to identify farmland birds and offering some, some hints and tips uh, to help you out during this year's count. Um, I'll talk briefly then about the sort of importance of, of monitoring and recording what we have on our farmland, uh, and particularly in the context of new agricultural schemes and payments in Wales. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll take some questions from the audience at the end. Um, so again, um, if you've got any questions, please, um, please write them using the the comments function. Um, the webinar is likely to last, well, a bit over an hour now that we started a bit late, uh, but it's not the end of the world if we go over time. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Matt. So the floor is yours. Yeah, Chris. Right, uh, I will start sharing my screen and then I'll chat away from there. So one second while I do that. So da, 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 da. that's sharing. Can everyone see that now? If I can get a thumbs up, Reese and Priyan, thank you very much. Brilliant. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, absolutely fantastic to, to, well, I can't see everyone, but um, to have you all with us. Um, really pleased with the turnout. And uh, yeah, so this evening, really, to look at the GWCT Big Family and Bird Count. Uh, learn a bit more about the initiative, why uh, we came up with the initiative, how to take part crucially, because we'd like you all to take part in the Big Family and Bird Count. So I'll go through how to, to do that. And then a couple of things as well we can do to encourage farm and birds um, across Wales. And, and also it's nice to see um, other people joining from uh, the rest of the UK, so England and Scotland too. So um, this is now in its ninth year, I believe. Uh, we started the uh, Big Farm and Bird Counts in uh, 2014, and it's grown from strength to strength, really. And I have to, at this point, give credit to, not individually to, to Rianne, but credit to the RSPB, um, because you will have seen uh, a week or two ago now, they did their big garden bird watch. And off the back of that, we thought, well, why can't we have a big farmland bird count? And uh, 
and get farmers involved in counting their birds and actually spread a good news story, a lot of positivity about this. And as I said, this has been going year on year now and the numbers have been building. So um, the participants have been increasing, the amount of land covers has been increasing. And that allows us to tell lots of good stories, good news stories about all the fantastic work that is going on out there to support our farm and birds. So I'll go into a bit more detail on that in a little bit, but we are uh, sponsored by the NFU and we are also supported by a number of organisations and really, really pleased to be having this uh, webinar this evening with Nature Friendly Farming Network and obviously with the, the RSPB too. So really grateful for that. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, just a bit of a, a brief history as to who we are uh, and what we do really. So in a nutshell, that's the, the kind of the title there, we use science to shape agricultural and environmental policies. So as, a, as an organisation in one form or another, we've been set up doing scientific research since the 1930s. Um, our history is in game management and in, in grape partridges, and then that has developed more and more and more um, to include all types of wildlife. And our work will be relevant from a Monroe up in Scotland to a chalk stream down in the south of England and, and everything in between. Um, in 1992, we got our first kind of demonstration farm. And then since then, our kind of our practices, I suppose, that we have researched has then played quite a large part in going into policy. I think when the, the first kind of stewardship schemes came about and you looked at all the options, about 70% of those options had some form of our science and our research in it. And the most important thing I'd say about the research that we do is we're trying to find practical solutions to the land management. Uh, we truly believe that you can have wildlife alongside productive farming. Uh, we do not have any kind of nature reserves and we probably never will have any nature reserves. And I think the stat for the UK is 79%, but certainly in, in Wales where we're, we're based this evening, the stat is about 88% of Wales is agricultural land. So I think if you're, you're to influence change in biodiversity and things like this, then you need to be doing it hand in hand with farming and that needs to be profitable, productive farming um, to be sustainable, really. So we see farmers as part of the solution. Uh, there's an awful lot of kind of negativity around farming in the press. Um, and this to us, the big farmland bird count, is a way of countering that and getting some really good news stories out there, as I've said. So um, we're talking about land sharing and not land sparing. There's some kind of really kind of topical stuff going on at the moment with things like rewilding and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, this stat I'll go on to in a minute just explains to us as a, as a reasoning why we need to be doing this land sharing because as I said farming is vitally important a lot of the UK and a lot of Wales is farmed um, in fact I'll go on to that now but this stat here there is a quarter of the land available per head of population to grow food on compared to 50 years ago and each day globally 210,000 people are added to us a net gain each day so we will need to feed those people so there's no question about that so food production is vitally important um, but we can have wildlife you know and it can go hand in hand and we've done the research we've done the, the science we've demonstrated that many times now um, so we've got a couple of things that we can share later on um, but it's also biodiversity by design and not biodiversity by accident so it's coming up with these solutions and putting them into place and actually making that difference. And as I've said there, farm profitability is essential. If we were to turn every farm into a nature reserve, many farms would go out of business and then they'd probably be you know, replaced by someone who wouldn't farm as a nature reserve. So that in its sense is, is, is not sustainable. Um, so we need to make sure that farms can be productive, they can be profitable and we can have wildlife alongside. Uh, and someone a couple of years ago to, to steal a quote off uh, a friend of mine, a farmer in Wales, John Yeomans, he said, you can't be green if you're in the red. And that, I think, is, is very true in that when you're struggling uh, and you're in the red, the last thing you, you might be thinking about is, is how you can you know, increase biodiversity on your farmland. Um, so it, I think having a productive, profitable farm 
is really key to that. So then what's the next step? How can we help wildlife alongside? So what we're asking people to do is this big farmland bird count. It's already started. So uh, it began last Friday on the 4th and it runs for two weeks and the, the weekends in between. So it finishes on the 20th of February this year. And there's no excuse now. We've held this webinar directly in the middle. So there's no excuse about people hearing about it and then forgetting. So we're, we're very hopeful that you'll go out uh, the next day or two and, uh, and complete this big farm of bird count. Um, I know that farmers are incredibly busy doing a great job, but we try and do this with it's only 30 minutes of your time. And actually spending that 30 minutes going out and, and watching and, and listening for birds can be can be really good for you. Um, so it's a really nice thing to be able to do if you can spare us 30 minutes. Um, you can go out with a notepad, a pencil and some binoculars. You can go out with a friend, with a family member, if you'd like to, if you're not too uh, confident on your bird ID, although after Rianne's session later, you'll be an expert, I'm sure. Um, but that's as simple as it is. And we're asking you to go and record the species that you see and also the number of those species as well. So for example, you might see some chaffinches and then you might see five or six chaffinches. So note that down as well. There is a count sheet that you can get from the website that's listed here, uh, www.bfbc.org.uk. And you can use that count sheet. And then when you're submitting your results later on online, which only takes about 10 minutes, maybe even less than that, I think now, um, then you can use that count sheet or use your notepad to fill in the details online. So everything that you might need to know about the big farmland and bird count is on that website there. There are ID guides and kind of helpful tips on how you can help individual species if there's a particular species that you're really interested in. So as I've explained, the big farmland bird count is exactly what it says on the tin. So it's an initiative encouraging farmers, land managers and gamekeepers to go out and count birds on their land. And that enables us to then shout about all the good work that's been done. It also uh, encourages that kind of connection uh, and it's really interesting, actually, that although farmers are outside on the land every day, because they're busy going about their day to day jobs, we've done a few studies kind of recently and asking farmers about things like feeding birds or providing certain habitats for birds or just doing this big farmland bird count and going out and watching for them. And actually, even though as a community, as farmers, we're outside uh, all the time anyway, actually just spending that time to stop and listen and look and see what's going on is, is really kind of beneficial um, for you. And, and then at the end of all of this, what I would always say is if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And what really this kind of comes on to is talking about how do we manage our wildlife? How do we manage our biodiversity to increase it? And how do we know it's increasing if we're not measuring it? And certainly what Reese is gonna talk about later and is relevant really to the rest of the UK as well, and certainly in England. Um, I'm not so sure with the, the Scottish policy, apologies from those from Scotland, but um, as we get these payments for public goods and they are looking at things like biodiversity, payments for biodiversity, then we need to evidence what we've got on our land. And the Big Farm and Bird Count is a fantastic starting point for doing that. If you haven't done it before, this year will form your baseline. And if you have taken part in the past previous years, then your baseline from a couple of years ago, you can see how that changes each year because you're going out, you're doing the same thing at the same time of year each, each year. And you can see how your birds are responding to certain management practices that you might be putting in place. So as I said, it's a 30 minute count. We ask you to go out to somewhere where you might be able to see about five acres of your farm, we've got two hectares, so that's about two football pitches, really. And um, have a sit down, have a stand for 30 minutes, quietly, just watching what's around. We do advise, if you've got somewhere really interesting on your farm, with, with lots of birds, to go there and have a look and see what's going on. So if you've got an area of a wild bird seed mix, a cover crop, that's providing kind of cover, but also seed through the winter, then that's normally a place where it's really good to, to see birds. Or also if you're doing some supplementary feeding, again, it's a bit of a honeypot scenario and you're drawing the, the birds to you. 
So you can go to somewhere like that. This isn't a citizen, well, this is citizen science. It's not a, a really in-depth, detailed scientific experiment. So you can skew the data by going to somewhere where you're likely to see the birds. And if you haven't got any of these things on your farm, then go into somewhere where you've got a mix of habitats. So most birds like the edges of habitats where you've got two or three habitats combining. So a woodland edge, a streamside corridor, a big thick hedgerow with a bit of a, a scrubby field corner, those kind of things. Or it might even be where you've got, uh, you know, kind of the corners of four different fields and you might have, if you're a mixed farm, you might have a pasture field, you might have, uh, you know, a fodder crop in one of the fields and you might have um, some winter cereal in another. And just having those mixes next to each other will often be a place with the, the hedgerows in between those where you might find some birds because there's a couple of different habitats. So go out and find somewhere where you're likely to see the birds and then spend a bit of time. And um, if you're constantly walking around, what you normally find is a birds fly away from you, especially if you're walking around with someone and you're having a chat. Um, now, you don't have to sit still for those 30 minutes. We do advise it. But if you've got a couple of different areas that you'd like to go to and set, have a look at what's going on, you can certainly do that. Um, but what I would say is just make sure you stop in for five or 10 minutes at each site. Um, to make sure that those birds get used to you being there and then they're active again instead of disappearing and, and hiding behind the other side of the hedgerow. Uh, the next thing I'll ask you to do after doing the count is make sure that you submit your count online because uh, the number of people I've spoken to and they said, oh yeah, I did the pig farm and bird count. It was really brilliant. I really enjoyed it. Saw lots and lots. I said, well, you know, did you remember to submit the, the results online? Oh no, I forgot. So um the really key part of it is submitting your results online. It only takes 10 minutes, but I think it actually takes less than 10 minutes. And once you do that, you'll create a record for your farm. Uh, and that's the thing that you can then compare year on year, but also you'll be able to see how you're doing regionally. So you can compare your data regionally and also um, across the country at the country level as well. So that's really important. And within uh, the record when you add the, there's there's these links to species information sheets and tips and hints to be able to help you with those species that you've actually recorded on your farm so it's really good um so now you kind of know what we're we're asking you to do um it's just a bit of a talk about you know why do we need to to go out and count our farmland birds and why do we need to give them a, a helping hand really before I go on to this bit, actually. I'll just go back to this picture here um, because people will often, one of the questions, and I'll preempt this question for later, why do we count birds at this time of year? There's often a question I'll get asked because most breeding bird surveys are obviously done in the breeding season. Now, this isn't a breeding bird survey, but to do something in the breeding season, there's an awful lot more vegetation. Everything's a lot greener, which is great I can't wait um, but you often can't see the birds then so you can't rely on them catching your eye you also need to be really good at knowing their calls and their songs to be able to ID them when it gets like that so at this time of year there's little vegetation so we can actually you know they'll catch our eyes they're moving around and we can see them if we take some binoculars we can we can spot them and we can identify them a little bit easier so there's that side of it but also at this time of year, it's a really critical time of year that many of our farmland birds are not surviving the winter very well. And especially as the case in Wales, in a lot of our pasture fields, there's very little seed availability. So lots of our birds that we'll talk about later, such as our finches as a, as a group, as an example, uh, need these seeds through the winter. And the, the lack of food and obviously lack of habitat um, can drive these overwinter um, or the overwinter mortality and these declines year on year. So by actually doing the count at this time of year, it's highlighting when these birds are most vulnerable, but also what we can do to help them at this time of year. So as I was saying, we think there's some fantastic work being done, but although that fantastic work is being done, many of our farmland birds are still in decline. This graph goes to highlight that. You can see this red line at the bottom is our farmland birds. And compared to everything else, farmland birds are doing the worst. Now, many of us will have our ideas as to why that is. And if we were all 
in a building together we could you know shout out answers and many of us will come up with with these in front of us here so these are kind of some of the commonly accepted reasons for farm and bird decline so intensification of agriculture increase in pesticide and fertilizer use move to winter cropping and block cropping a loss of mixed farming drainage of land loss of habitat an increase in predators and climate change and what i've done uh, for everyone sat in wales here is i've actually highlighted the ones that i think are most key in wales so loss of mixed farming i think is has drive, driven a lot of um, our farm and bird decline the drainage of land when we look at our curlew and the dire straits area and lapwing we're in the same boat but less talked about drainage of land is, a, is an issue there the loss of habitat it says they're mainly in the past and that's very true if, if i was to put that on a graph for you you'd see that decline in habitat but then it's tailed off and in some cases now it's actually increasing with the help of agri-environment schemes but um certainly historical loss of habitat has been an issue and if you look at kind of the decrease in the number of ponds there's less than 50 percent of the ponds there used to be we used to have ponds to obviously uh, water livestock and, and draft horses and things like that um and we don't they've all been kind of filled in so you can see that loss of habitat there an increase in predators is another one the uk has the kind of the, the highest number of, of generalist predators across europe so that's an issue in itself and there are many reasons for that um so i'm quite happy to answer questions on that later but there are there are many reasons for that and then obviously climate change can affect the range of species and we might be now getting towards the southern end of certain the southern kind of range of certain species and then other species may be coming further north so climate change can play a part as well but just to, to highlight in wales i haven't highlighted that intensification of agriculture and i haven't highlighted that increase in pesticide and fertilizer use only about 14 percent of wales is is arable um, farming um, and i think in the rest of the uk and certainly maybe um, the south and, and east of england um, which is dominated more by arable the intensification of agriculture and the increase in pesticide and fertilizer use has had that uh, influence on farm and birds but i think in wales it's slightly different because we've gone away from arable farming we've got away from mixed farming at, at one stage most livestock farms would have had some spring cropping to help feed the livestock through the winter and we've lost all of that and with that i think that's been one of the the reasons for our decline in these typical farm and birds that do eat seeds through the winter so it's all very doom and gloom until you know we talk about what can be done and there's hope at the end of the tunnel here so this graph here the blue shows our national breeding birds and that decline that I was showing you from before. So that's from 1966 when they started doing these counts and goes all the way down there. So this graph stops at 2002 and you can see our red line there for the GWCT, the Game of Wildlife Conservation Trust. This is where we started our demonstration farm. Now it's over in England, in Leicestershire, the Allerton project. And we took that on in 1992 and we put a number of measures in place there and it made our farmland bird population boom and the really important thing with that was that people were saying up to that point that it had taken decades for the decline to get as low as it had and it would therefore take decades for us to be able to increase the number of birds again and you can see there within the first kind of three or four years we actually got most of our gains and that was by introducing these three things so the original three-legged stool was a concept by a fantastic ecologist called Dick Potts who did an awful lot of work into to great partridges and he was finding that obviously if you're spraying weeds out of a crop there's no uh, seed there from the weeds but also there's uh, if you're also putting insecticides on there's no insects there or either um, to be feeding chicks and things like that so that was the original three-legged stool we've slightly adapted that now when we look at this and we we need habitat and habitat is a foundation for all of this. We need uh, good habitat that provides nesting sites. We need good habitat for certain species that also provides that, that food. Um, so habitat is essential, but food provision through the winter for those seed eating birds is absolutely critical. Even in areas where you've got you know, um, harvests still, so in the loss of whales with the pasture, we haven't in many areas now, but even in those areas because of the um, 
combining, becoming so efficient, there's very little seed available out there now anyway. So actually providing seed for these birds through the winter is really, really key. And then the other leg of our three-legged stool is to reduce predation pressure as well. And all of those three things combined actually gave us this huge increase in our uh, breeding birds at our demonstration site. Again, happy to answer questions on that later. So just to kind of summarize what our birds need, and it's not rocket science, but what we need to do is we need to think of year round. You know, in the past we might have thought, oh, well, we've, um, we haven't got many older trees anymore well, because you know, in the past we've felled the trees, they've blown over in the wind, we've taken our hedgerows out, et cetera, et cetera, through government funded schemes. Um, so we might put nest boxes up. So that only addresses a small part of the, the equation. So we need to think year round needs. We need to think of obviously nesting sites, but we need to think of what do the chicks need in terms of uh, chick rearing habitat that looks different for different species. But all of our species, apart from our kind of our pigeons and our doves who provide a crop milk, pretty much all the others need insects, which are high in protein. So we need insect rich habitats to feed our chicks and we need uh, seed rich areas for those certain species um, through the year as well and especially in the winter and I've put that note at the bottom there that the way that we deliver the above is obviously different for different species and what I think is the best way uh, for you guys to do this as farmers on your own farms is to think back to what you used to have what you like seeing what are you most interested in seeing more of and to focus on a couple of species we've done some work recently on curlew and the, the greater benefits for curlew and even just by focusing on one species like curlew we found that there are a total of 87 additional species that can benefit from that work targeted at curlew so although governments recently and, and welsh government have moved away from looking at single species what I think we find is if we focus on a single species, that really gets our interest. That's you know, what we can get really passionate about. And then that's what then can benefit lots of other species too. But we need to think, you know, am I interested in um, getting yellow hammers back or increasing my number of yellow hammers? Or is it uh, something different? You know, is it a polar opposite? We could say something like a lapwing. Or if we wanted to stay similar to yellow hammers, but talk about something slightly different, we could say, um, chaffinches and they have different kind of nesting requirements so and um, depending on what you're looking at it could be tree sparrows um, will depend on what you put in place for them so very kind of quickly then just to highlight all of these kind of things uh, we're looking at the habitat um, this should be in an ideal world funded through a good agri-environment system you know, if we're taking land out of production we need that to be paid for by a stewardship scheme in the ideal world. And certainly where we get our best results is where um, these kind of things go hand in hand together. So that's really important. And what that also allows us to do is focus our efforts on our productive areas of the farm. We can focus efforts on increasing their um, capacity there. So on our grass fields, it could be focusing on the soil health of those the soil health of those grass fields and increasing our grass yield on those really productive areas. But then the slightly unproductive areas, we could be saying, well, how can we manage this better for wildlife? So having kind of buffer strips and corridors and things like that is vitally important. And I'll just highlight this one on the, the top left with the hedgerows. I often get people telling me, oh, you know, I've put X kilometers of hedgerows in and they're all really good, but they're often farmed right up to the hedge base. Now, if you can leave a strip next to the hedge so we can get quite tussocky and quite thick lots of uh, lots of birds appreciate that uh, and things like yellow hammers i mentioned before uh, will nest almost on the ground but in this kind of tussocky stuff at the base of a hedge where it's nice and thick so that's good and then it also come the spring summer will also be full of insects so doing that on the southern facing side of a hedge you don't have to do it everywhere but picking a couple of fields and maybe doing that on the southern facing so it's getting the sun and it's nice and warm that's quite a nice thing to do Obviously, with water quality, the bottom left, fencing off streamside corridors not only improves water quality, but it also provides additional habitat. So that's great for things like reed bunting, but then also, again, full of insects. And then the bottom right, traditional hay meadow. Appreciate not everyone could have that in every field, but actually looking at things like that or looking at herb rich swords and things like that uh, just increases the variety of plant life and that increases the variety of insect life and that can help our birds too. 
or we might look at leaving a strip, although I was told the other day that that's not a strip, it's quite a big chunk, um, to which I said, well, the, the grass part of the, the green part of the field goes on and on and on into a huge field and, and the hedge is just the other side cut out of this. So I was trying to argue that it was a strip, but uh, still a fairly large strip. But what that is, is letting ryegrass from a silage field actually leaving the strip to set seed. And again, that's been proven to help our, our farm and birds, especially things like yellow hammers. But then something like this, uh, which in, in most cases is a, is a sheep farmer's nightmare because of things like liver fluke. Um, but our lapwing population is really, really struggling. And we not only need areas for them to nest, but we need areas for them to forage and for their chicks to forage. And where you get wet patches like this and exposed mud, you get lots of insects and they'll find the insects there and that's what they'll, they'll use. So if you have still got lapwing in the area and if you are really kind of invested in lapwing as a species and you want them to do better, then finding ways of adopting this kind of thing into your farm. And it doesn't have to be all over the place, as I've said, a lot of this is tweaking our management slightly and introducing that one or two percent where we can. And then again, kind of um, fodder crops. This is a fantastic habitat for, for birds. And we'll often get these on the areas that these would be the birds, the areas where the birds are flocking to because we've got a microclimate within there. We'll get overwintering insects within there. So things like blackbirds and song thrushes will absolutely love that. And then often because we'll be feeding the sheep and there'll be hay bales in there and things like that. Finches going to there and things like that. So even if we can't put a we can introduce things like this. This is a brood rearing strip. So this will be again full of insects um, and provide that insect rich um, habitat for our birds to feed their chicks from. Or leaving a conservation headland and leaving it unsprayed. Um, allows it to have weeds in there um, and then you're providing weeds you're, you've got the weeds will provide seed if they're left for the winter but also it gives something for the insects to go on and again that, that provides insects too so there's there's all these different benefits that we can do but this to me is the ultimate of what can be provided for our farmland birds and this is a wild bird seed mix here this is a two-year crop so it's got kale on there which won't set seed this year um, but it's got things in there like mustard it's got things in there like oil radish and gold of pleasure, and they're all providing seed this winter. And then that green area there, the kale, the utopia, that kale will flower next year. So that'll be fantastic for pollinators. All of this stuff is fairly deep rooting. So it's great for, for um, our soil health. And then that kale sets seed in the second year. So you've got a two year crop there. You've halved the establishment costs. And just to point out that that was done on a lowland organic dairy farm in Wales. So even on organic farms, we can produce really good wild bird seed mixes like this. And then this was done, this is about 700 meters up, about a thousand feet up on a, on a hill farm in Wales. And again, a fantastic wild bird seed mix for, uh, for our birds. Um, and just to point out there that it, it can be done anywhere. We've got all the problems with high altitude, poorer soils, the aspect, and all these kind of things and and i've just proven on two photos there in a lowland organic and a, an upland uh, hill sheep farm that we can we can actually introduce these conservation measures but of course they should be paid for properly and realistically um, by a good stewardship scheme in the future just to highlight then the benefit of these crops now you can't really see the black bar and the white bar to the right hand side of these because they don't really register they'll probably be one to two birds per hectare but actually the yellow indicates how good a wild bird seed mix is on an arable farm and how many birds it gets in there and you can see that's substantially higher than the, the, the crops next to them but then to further highlight how good a wild bird seed mix is in a grass environment where as i was saying before there's very little seed through the winter it draws birds in like a magnet and it's absolutely fantastic and that really helps them then survive through the winter but you'll notice even as we get to february even the best cover crops will be losing their seed they'll become seed depleted and that's where supplementary feeding really comes to the fore and really helps those birds and get through 
get into the breeding season at the right weight and good condition. And the theory is that they will breed better um, and have a better chance of, of breeding successfully. So the red bar there is what we could see before. So you've got a cover crop, but no supplementary feeding. And you get to the end of December, January, and those bird numbers tail off. And they're not just disappearing, often they're, they're dying because there's, there's not enough food for them. Um, but if we add in supplementary feed into that equation, we get them going all the way through the year into the breeding season in good condition. And not only does it draw birds in from further afield to that place, the research that we've done actually shows that then if you go and survey all the hedges close to that um, wild bird seed mix, up to kind of around 400 metres away really, and what you'll find is you find more birds breeding um, within those hedges than you do on farms where there aren't these wild bird seed mixes. So if I was going to get asked what is the most efficient way of delivering habitat for these farm and birds, it would be going towards something like this, a wild bird seed mix. You can see this is how many birds they'll hold. This is a tiny little portion of a cover crop and all those birds in there getting up. And the reason being is this sparrow hawk coming through chasing that poor bugger there. And then again, you think they've all got up, but there's even more in there. And I have to say, because I was stood next to the cameraman, I was hoping he was a bit kind of further zoomed out on this one because what you actually got there was the sky almost went black with the number of birds getting up. And there was about three separate flocks of about, let's say, 100 finches in each. That would be an underestimate. And they were mainly linnets, but there was also some brambling in there, some chaffinch in there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is what they're doing in there. So these are linnets. These are red listed. And you can see them there quite happy eating the seed that's in there. And they'll spend most of the day, especially when it's cold, uh, most of the day just flitting in and out from the hedgerow, from the trees into the cover crop, having a bit of a fill, going back, digesting it and back and forth. And this is one of those um, flocks of linnets getting up. And you can hear the sound with this as well. Can you hear the sound, Reese? No. In that case, it may be. I need to share sound. I'll just play that one again, if I can. This is where we may have a problem. <laughs> oh, there you go. Can you hear that? Oh, it's done. <laughs> So apart from the road noise in the background, that's a mixed flock of finches. And the reason I've put that in there is how often these days do you hear that sound in the middle of the day, but also see that many birds in a flock that isn't a flock of starlings or this time of year isn't a flock of red wings. So, and they've all just flown up from that, that cover crop I mentioned a minute ago. So we know that this can make an awful lot of difference. Adding into the, the equation here is a supplementary feeder. I've kept this one in here just to show you. Um, I don't think I can use a pointer on this, but you've got obviously the pheasant feeding at the bottom on all the stuff that's been chucked over the, their shoulders because they get really fussy with the mix in there. There'll be things like obviously wheat in there, but there's linseed in there, there's millet, there's sunflower hearts, there's all sorts of things. It's just like a mix that you might have in your garden, but there's a greater spotted woodpecker on the feeder. There's a nut hatch the other side of the feeder. Then there's a chaffinch flying up onto the feeder. There's a chaffinch on the floor as well. There's a great tit on the fence line to the left, and there's actually a cold tit all the way on the right-hand side of that. And we did um, a project here in Wales where we found there's 22 different species of birds using these feeders. So um, it was quite impressive. It goes to show you many of them are, but the vital thing with this is that we use them in conjunction with our cover crops and not just on their own. So here's a, a video some brambling on one of the feeders you can see there kind of snow and sleet going past so really terrible weather just to highlight the time of year when there's so little food out there and doing this it's not rocket science it's just like we do in our uh, in our gardens we're doing it out on the farmland and it makes a huge huge difference to the survival of our farmland birds so just in summary then i think i have overrun slightly quite a bit but um, we need to provide year-round habitat, we need nesting places, insect-rich areas and overwinter food. And I'm asking you, please, 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 to go out and count the birds on your farm. 
30 minute count, find somewhere interesting on the farm, take a notepad or the count sheet, which you can get off the website below, take a, a pencil or a pen, binoculars, take a friend if you're not so confident with your bird ID, um, and go out and have a look and see what you can find. And then please, please, please don't forget to submit the results. Just as a, I'm sure that actually, um, Brianne, I'll, I'll go through all of this, but if you're not sure with your bird ID, just make some notes, make it some notes on the size of it, make some notes on some of the key features. You know, what, what color was it is a simple one. Did it have uh, an eye stripe? Um, was it a speckled chest? Was it in the hedge or out in the field? Was it in a flock or on its own? All of these things can help us when we go back in later and have a look at ID in it from maybe a bird book or something like that. Um, so please do the survey, please encourage your neighbors, your uh, friends to go out and do the count as well. And this thing at the end there, don't just be proud of your birds, be loud, tell everyone about the birds that you see, tell people that you've got lots of farmland birds and, uh, and yeah, you know, you can you can uh, go on Twitter for those of you that are social media savvy and there's these uh, hashtags. But the most important thing is go out there, take part in it and enjoy it. And uh, I'll just leave that there as a final thing uh, for those of you in Wales. Uh, uh, kind of new this year with Farming Connect, we're able to offer uh, advisory visits um, to farmers to, to talk about biodiversity and how things can be um, enhanced, if you like, and tweaked. So if there isn't anything um, that you'd like to look at, we do these Farming Connect visits, uh, part funded now in Wales, and, and there's obviously my details on there. So just a, a plug at the end, I couldn't resist. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much everyone for listening. Please go out and do the count, and I'll pass you now over to um, Rianne, who is going to talk to you about bird ID, and then we'll have something from Reese at the end, and then time for questions. If Rianne's still here. Yep, I am. Yep. <laughs> and hopefully you can see my screen. Oh no. I can see you. Hmm. Ah, there we go. You've started. Oh. Yes, brilliant. Got you. Right, I'll mute myself. <laughs> okay, good evening, everyone. So I'm not going to make any pretense that I'm going to teach you all how to identify birds in the next half an hour. Um, it takes years. I won't lie to you. I've driven around the countryside with cassette tapes of bird songs playing to me for many years until I get it into my thick skull. Um, it does take time and practice, but obviously, hopefully a few tips to help. Uh, how do I make my... Oh, there you go. Cool. So um, Matt touched on this. A few things to consider when you see a bird. Basically, where did you see it? So, for example, um, you might have seen something that looked like a blue tit, but you're in a conifer woodland. So the chances of it being a blue tit are slim, but it's quite likely to be a coal tit. So things like that. So uh, there are obviously brown spotty birds that only ever live by the coast. And if you see a brown spotty bird on a mountain, chances are it's going to be more of a meadow pipit or a skylark rather than something that you'll see on the coast. Um, obviously, it's important to try and get the size and colour. Um, in a lot of bird ID books, they might compare it to a pigeon or a sparrow. Is it bigger or smaller than the pigeon? Is it bigger or smaller than the sparrow? Um, the sound it makes. So obviously, as you're whizzing around your farm on your quad bike or in your mule, you might not hear much. But perhaps at lambing time, if you lamb outdoors you're walk or checking your crops, you're on foot uh, and you can hear what's going on. Um, and they're very subtle differences, especially, say, um, we talked about those mixed finch flocks. Uh, so the goldfinch and the linnet, they've both got a zzz in their call or a green finch, you've got a zzz. But it's the slight subtle differences uh, that will help you distinguish. So like Matt said, at this time of year, you can see them. There's no leaves on the trees. So you're going more for size and color rather than their call. And then finally, there's the jizz. I'm not entirely sure what jizz, where that word comes from. It's just something. It's just like something that you see and you think, oh, that's going to be a starling. And um, it's just like the behavior, what it's doing, where it is. So as your farmers, I thought I'd start with some sheep. So 
pretty basic and I don't want to patronize anyone, but to the general public, these are all white sheep. If you asked anyone, they'd be like, they're just white sheep. But we all know that there are actually three completely different breeds of sheep. Their head shape is different. The way they hold their ears are different. The size of their ears are different. The wall, whether it's a tight wall or a long staple of wall, and also where you'd find them, whether it's the top of the mountain. So we've got a Texel, a Welsh, and a South Down. So you're not going to find a Texel on top of the mountain. So if you see a white sheep on the top of the mountain, it's not going to be a Texel. Like I said, I don't want to be patronizing, but I just thought this is quite a nice analogy. Could have done it with crops. I could have done wheat, barley, and oats. To the general public, they're just tall grasses. But to the farmer, you can look specifically and identify a bit closer. So at least because you've got your eye in for livestock, um, it'll help when it comes to bird ID. So I thought I'd start with some black birds. And this is really important because currently only one of these birds, for example, on the picture, you're allowed to shoot. And that is a crow. Um, so obviously a black bird, black bill. If you look at the rook, it's a black bird with a white bill. And that's actually really important because um, rooks are on their way to being red listed in the UK. They're severely in decline across Europe and um, it is illegal to kill them. Uh, the raven, let's have a look. So the raven, you could say, oh, well, it's similar to the crow. It's just black with a black bill, but it's much bigger. And if you look at the shape of its bill, it's like fatter, it comes out higher up the head and it's fatter somehow, obviously because it's a carrion eating bird. So it needs to have a stronger bill. And then the jack door that you often see on the, the roof around your farm buildings, it's quite distinctive again, because actually it's got a little hat on its head. Uh, there is a Welsh poem which refers to the uh, to that white hat. And I thought I'd play the tunes, the songs of these four birds, because it's quite a good place to, to start. So. The crow. So you're probably all quite familiar with that core 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 of a crow. Piss! Hey, stop! I don't know why it's not stopped. Oh, oh, we've gone to rock. Now we're trying. Okay, so the raven, you probably could hear it was a much deeper throaty sound. I actually think of it as uh, being a bit like a toad. Like, so when I hear a raven flying over, I don't know, I picture a flying toad. Uh, we'll play the jackdaw next because it's quite different again. So it's a much higher pitch. Oh. So the jackdaws are much higher pitch and it sounds to me like they're having a chat because they you never really see a jackdaw on its own and so you hear that high pitch chat 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 and i'm going to play you the rock now and this is quite an important one okay uh so the rock does indeed sound very like the crow. And this is where not just your ear identification, but your eye has to be in. So there is a bit of a saying is basically, if you see a field full of crows, the chances are they're rooks because crows are quite antisocial and they don't normally hang around in a gang. Um, so just so you know, so a lot of farmers I come across, they go, oh, my fields are full of crows. And when I look, it's actually a field full of rooks and they're eating earthworms. And they're actually quite a good sign, good indicator of good soil health. Um, okay, next. So I thought I'd cover a few birds of prey. So obviously these, they're gonna be higher often. Um, and we're now looking at different things, maybe the shape of the wing in flight as they're hovering. So if you look at the buzzard, they've got quite rounded tips to the end of their wings. 
um, in comparison to the kestrel, for example, that's got pointy ends to the wings. So you might think, okay, but the kestrel's small and the buzzard's big, but sometimes you can't judge how high up in the sky they're flying. So it's then difficult to judge the size. But if you look, kestrel, pointy ends, buzzard, round ends. Both of them, we, I mentioned jeers at the beginning, both of them will hover in hunting, but I think they are the only two birds of prey that will hover when they're hunting. So say if you're out there and you see a hovering bird of prey, you can immediately narrow it down to either a buzzard or a kestrel. If you're lucky, you can see that the kestrel's a bit red, you might be able to see the pattern underneath the buzzard. But if you can't see, maybe the sun's in your eyes and they're just a black silhouette against the sky, you can then look at wing shape. Um, I've included the red kite. That's a fantastically dis distinctive silhouette with its tail shape. If you look at, um, it's the only one with like a concave, concave tail. So obviously the coloring is different, the shape of the wings are different and the pattern under the wings are different, but it is the tail that everybody um, focuses on. And then I've put in the hen harrier. So this is an interesting one because obviously they're not that numerous. They're often in high up mountains. But for these, the um, distinguishing feature um, for the amateur bird watcher anyway, is on its back. So that's quite annoying. So basically the hen harrier dis distinguishing feature is the white bit on its rump. No other bird of prey has a white bit on its rump. Luckily, the hen harrier does have a really acrobatic flight. So it does uh, swing from side to side and move quite a lot. So you are, the chances of you seeing that white bit is actually quite high. Whereas the other birds, they might swing to side to side, but they're not gonna have that white rump. You may have a bird watching friend and you may have heard of LBJs, the little brown jobs. Basically something small and brown that maybe flits in and out of the hedge or the undergrowth or a bit of woodland and you're like, oh, it was brown, it was little and it was a bird. So sadly, these ones do take a bit more patience and you basically just wait until you get a good view of them. Um, so I've included, so the dunner and the house sparrow, for example, these are often confused because they, they're seen too quickly, especially the dunnock and the female house sparrow, which is the picture on the top. But actually, when they're still in a photo, you can see they're quite different. The dunnock is, is a grey head and a grey stripy chest, and the female house sparrow is actually a bit more yellowy. Um, and then there's the male house sparrow at the bottom. Uh, so he's got a bright chest and head, white cheeks and a grey patch on the top of his head. Um, some of you, if you've got some beautiful, thick hedges, well managed for nature with some uh, nice hedge margins like Matt shown you. Some of you may be lucky enough to have tree sparrows, which um, very similar to, obviously, to the house sparrow, but the male tree sparrow doesn't have the grey cap. His head is all chestnut on the top. Um, but again, in a fleeting glance, you may not see that. You may need to stop and pause. Um, the problem I have when I go around my farm is that I nearly always have my sheepdogs with me. Um, and they're not very good at sneaking. And they're definitely not very good at being patient and waiting. So um, some birds you can see with your dogs or with you as you're wandering around. Others, yeah, you've got to be on your own, basically. And then the wren, the little drew, another little brown bird and obviously quite distinctive. There's no other little brown bird that sticks its tail in the air. So if you see a little brown bird um, coming out the hedge with its tail up, it's a wren. Its call is also really distinctive. Its voice, it's, I should have put it on here, but, but you can't tell until it's in, your, in the habitat, in the hedge or something. It's so loud. The, the song of the wren is far too loud for the size of the little body that it comes out of. It, you know, really is quite impressive. So, uh, what's another? Winter. Oh, no. Okay, let it ring, let it sing. 
So that is the song of the yellow hammer. And what the yellow hammer is saying is that it would like a little bit of bread and no cheese. A little bit of bread and no cheese. And as lovely as my singing is, I will let you listen to it again. Ah. I'm sorry. I thought I was playing a goldfinch afterwards. I'm not sure why it keeps going to the next song. So the yellow hammer. So these are the birds that Matt was talking about that really need seeds in winter. So you might wonder what they eat the rest of the time. Well, in the summer months, there's plenty of little midges and insects around for them to eat and feed their young on. Plus, there's obviously uh, summer seeding plants. Um, so the, they all like, so the goldfinch likes the seed of teasel or even thistles. Um, obviously farmers don't like thistles but um, I'm just saying and but the yellow hammer really loves the insects found on something like um, a gorse bush um, and I know on the Cludion Hills here uh, where I live there's loads of gorse uh, for whatever reason it's not been a tradition to cut or burn the gorse on the Cludion Hills so there's plenty of gorse which means there's plenty of flowers plenty of nectar plenty of insects loads of yellow hammers and I don't think you need to get an ID book out to recognise the yellow hammer. I've also included the goldfinch. Again, another seed eating bird, really, really needs seeds to get it through winter. Um, and I mentioned before about the finches, they all have a little in their song. Um, so let's listen to the goldfinch. Again, I feel that it's like it's like having a really little chat. It's like chatting to its other mates. Hey, I found a nice bit of thistle. Hey, no, I've got a bit of teasel over here. Hey, come over back over here. There's a nice bit of thistle. Um, these ones obviously will pop out the hedge as you go in past. Um, here I've got two pictures of the linnet. So a lot of birds, only like top notch bird, bird birders, can identify the difference between male and female. Whereas some are pretty obvious. So with the linnet here, it's very distinctive. The female probably falls into the category of little brown job. She's just brown, but very distinctive stripes on her chest. Uh, whereas the male, very easy, especially in his summer breeding, breeding plumage. So we've also got winter migrants, so birds that may not necessarily breed here, but move to the UK when the continent, European continent gets too cold for them. So our winter is obviously a lot milder. And if they're lucky, if we haven't cut all the berries off the hedges, there's more food for them here. So we've got the field fair, uh, which, to, to be honest, this winter, there haven't been as many field fairs or red wings in the UK because it's been a milder winter everywhere. They haven't actually had to leave the continent to come to the Wales or to, yeah, to the UK farmland. Um, and they're usually in flocks. Um, so the field fair, if any of you've got any apple trees in, in your garden or orchard, um, they're usually like the bullies of your of um, the apples that, you, that have fallen on the floor. They seem to know where the fruit trees are. And if anyone else comes into that garden, they chase them away. So if a blackbird's trying to have a bit of apple, they chase them away. Um, so those are usually in smaller flocks, they're bigger. Um, and they're relatives to the song thrush and the missile thrush, which do stay here and breed all year round. Uh, the red wing. It's pretty obvious why it's called the red wing because it has red under the wing. But sometimes if it's in taller vegetation, you might not see that. What, what is distinctive is the white eye stripe above the eye. So if you're going about and you're not and you're trying to identify birds, just make a note of where you see the white eye stripe. Some, some have it above, some have it below, some might have a white necklace. 
And something you might not think is that important is the difference between one species and, and another. Um, and I've also included a picture of starling. It's actually in summer plumage. Um, and I know in the farming world, especially if you've got cattle, they can be a nuisance, but you also have to admire its beauty. It's like a beautiful, oily, iridescent colour with all those dots on, the, on its back, like a starry night. And obviously the murmurations they create are just fantastic to watch. Red-breasted birds. Um, so I didn't really know how to categorize my slides to help with bird ID, but I was just trying to point out, obviously, some are different shapes, some are in different habitats. Some may actually be kind of the same color, but once you start looking at them closer, if you take a bit of time, it becomes really obvious. So obviously we have the robin um, and the wintering robins that we see in the garden are probably uh, not the same ones that you see in the summer. They'll be winter migrants from Europe. Um, you can't really tell the difference between a male and a female robin. Um, and yeah, but everyone's familiar with that. So we've got the red-breasted the stone chat. And I, the picture says it all. It's often seen on a bit of gorse. And I've got a bit of song to play. I don't know if you can hear that, but it sounds like two stones clacking together. And if you're ever on the mountain, walking, checking your sheep, whatever, it's so distinctive, it's clack, 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 clack. The wind chat does make a similar noise, but they're incredibly scarce. And they're also more secretive. So often if you hear that chat, chat noise, and you're thinking, oh, is it a stone chat or a wind chat? And you, you look around, follow the noise, the stone chat is quite a brazen little bird and it'll be on a fence post or a bit of barbed wire or a piece of gorse saying, look at me. And obviously this distinguishing feature as well is it's got a white necklace. We've then got the bullfinch. And the bullfinch is one of my favorite birds because it's, um, it's so bright, and but it's so quiet as well. It loves a thick old hedge. Um, or actually, as the Welsh name suggests, Corchabertlan, red of the orchard. So somewhere with old trees. And it's got that thick beak, you can see, perfect for cracking open seeds. Um, and the reason I like it is because it's cool, it's really quiet. It's song, it's just really subdued. And you've got to, and once you've mastered the art of IDing a bullfinch and hearing a bullfinch, I guarantee you'll be able to tune your ear into hearing and seeing anything. Um, and then I've also included the common red poll. So another linnet or a, a bird of the linnet or finch family, another seed eaters, like we've seen before, which require additional seeds in winter, whether that's as a growing crop, wildflowers, or uh, in a feeder. Um, someone has uh, just gone into the waiting room, so I've just clicked them. Um, and finally, I've got some rarities. And I'll tell you now, if you've got any of these birds, um, preferably breeding on your land, but even wintering on your land, then you are incredibly lucky. Uh, as mentioned before, there's lots of reasons behind their decline. Uh, so if you still have some, you must be doing something right. And um, yeah, uh, both the lapwing and the curlew oh, and the golden plover, they all require wet, damp soil. And this is where land drainage comes into play. Because as you can imagine, with those long builds, they're actually for probing into the soil to get soil insects. And if the soil is drained, um, like I know Curly had a really bad time three years ago when we had the drought in May, they couldn't get enough food to feed their chicks. Um, look how cute that lapwing chick is as well. Surely, doesn't everyone want to try and save the lapwings? Right, let's play a lapwing.
Oh. It's a beautiful sound. And um, I'd really encourage, if, if you haven't heard it before, to go to uh, some wetland reserve or find a farmer that's still lucky enough to have them on their farm. Um, they're becoming more and more rare on active farmland because they really love a spring sown crop and the number of farmers who either don't grow crops anymore, I know we don't here anymore, we just buy in some straw and buy in feed, um, or they've gone to a winter sown crop. And basically the, the lapwing really loves bare soil for her uh, to lay its, lay its eggs in. Uh, we've also got the chuff. Um, it's actually a member of the crow family. If I play you the call, it'll be complete, it sounds completely different to the, the crow or the raven. Or, um... So um, sadly, reasons behind most of the declines in chuff, which um, a mountain mountain birds or coastal birds in Wales, we, we have the, um, we have a large proportion of chuff out of the world population in Wales, but they've declined massively in the mountains of Wales, mostly due to undergrazing. So a lot of the birds I talked about this evening, they are actually farmland birds, they rely on active farming, they're not birds of rewilding, they're not birds of land abandonment, they're birds of active farming. So the chuff, due to, um, massive reductions in grazing in, in places where they would have historically bred. The vegetation is now too tall for them to poke their beaks into the soil and get food out. We've got the golden plover up at the top. This is incredibly scarce, so only a few of you would ever see this bird. Uh, that's it in its breeding plumage. Also, it's called so quiet that, um, yeah, you've got to be pretty good to spot that. But let's, I'm going to end with the curlew, with a, an iconic call and something that probably your fathers and definitely your grandfathers would have known without fail. Um, couple of big reasons behind the decline of this. I saw someone put something in the chat earlier about the change from silage making to from hay making to silage making. This is a big thing because Curly used to love nesting in hay fields, which was fine when they weren't cut until July. But now we know, you know, nutritional value of silage is much better. You get much better yield of either milk or faster growing rates in your livestock if you cut it every five to six weeks, which unfortunately when um, a curly chick doesn't fly for the first six weeks of its life usually mean, means they get pulverized. Uh, and the second big thing for all of these birds actually, but is predation, uh, foxes and crows. Um, so once you know the difference between crows and rocks, I would actively encourage you to control your crows, especially if you have any of these rare birds on your land. Um, I think, oh, you want to have a hmm. So that is me. Uh, yeah. I'll hand you back to Rhys. Well, get it done then. <laughs> Scream all you want. Don't I, hate. Don't even think. Don't. Don't, even, don't make don't things even. worse for yourself. Oh. Anyone want to mute their, um, <laughs> mute their computer? <laughs> I don't know what was going on there. Uh, quite, quite, quite a stark difference to the to the beautiful. Uh, Curly recall earlier, uh, Rian. Uh, how am I supposed to follow? How am I supposed to follow that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, um, the most is just stop your hand at the screen, then, Rian. Oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, Sorry. Spot on. Um, thank you so much for those two talks. They, they, they were terrific. Um, and just to say, yeah, thank you, Matt. I think that the, the big family bird count is, is a superb initiative. Uh, and a great way of, of getting farmers and, and landowners sort of more involved 
uh, and engaged in, in recording wildlife uh, on the farms. Um, just that, yeah, some really interesting points really on, on sort of um, on kind of why we've seen the decline um, in farming birds. And I, I particularly agree with the 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 loss of mixed farming. Um, I was looking at um, some old land use maps from from our valley in the Union Valley um, the other day and from like from the 1930s, 20s, 40s, and almost every single farm in the valley at that time would have some sort of land dedicated to, to arable cropping. Um, obviously, we, we've lost that now, and farming has become a bit more specialised, I guess. So it would be great to see um, as future schemes kick in that kind of uptake of, of um, wild, um, wild bird cover crops, etc. And and just on the points that Glenda was making, really, and Rhiann on on the lo loss uh, of grazing, but in particular, I think the loss of cattle grazing in the upland as well with heavier stock, um, which is good, are really sort of managing that millennia habitat, which is, if it's kept unchecked, can stifle uh, the growth of other plants. So you lose the botanical interest, but also the ground becomes a bit too rank for, for ground nesting birds like curlew to, to nest as well. Um, and I think a point, I thought, I'm not sure that was mentioned, but, I think inappropriate afforestation as well has played its part, um, especially for you know the, some of the most threatened birds like uh, the curlew um, and, and golden plover who sort of nest nest on the ground, particularly in, in the uplands. Um, so it just really highlights that importance of planting the right tree in the right place, and I think they they also um, contribute to to the to the to the predator problem as well. Sort of these um, commercial plantations that harbour um, and foxes and crows next to areas that would have been used uh, by birds like the curly. Um, and Rian, um, that was that was a really great um, insight into terms of how to identify uh, farmed birds. Um, and I hope, yeah, it can help prepare us uh, for the counts really and offer a taste of what what bird life we might find on our farms. Uh, you know, I, I'm a keen bird. I've been for a few years, and, and I learned a lot from. From your presentation, so the Ochamaria and Hina. But just look, looking at um, the wider picture, really, um, you know, I think recording and, and monitoring birds, you know, or any wildlife, really, for that matter, um, is going to be uh, really important uh, going forward, uh, particularly in the context of, of new agricultural schemes uh, and payments in Wales. Um, so now that we've left the uh, European Common Agricultural Policy, uh, you know, farming uh, is devolved in Wales. You know, the Welsh Government, they've got a clean slate uh, for all sense of purposes when it comes to designing a new farming policy uh, and support system in Wales. Um, from our understanding, the, the Welsh Government hope to launch the proposed uh, Sustainable Farming Scheme. Uh, so this is a scheme that will actually replace the basic payment scheme uh, and the associated agri-environment schemes in Wales um, in 2025. Um, but that I think there will be a transition period as we phase out the EPS. Um, so and we're expecting the first draft of this scheme to be published um, sometime this spring, summer. Uh, but if you've read the, the previous Welsh Government's consultations you know, on future agricultural policies, um, the scheme the new scheme uh, will be more focused on, on sort of paying farmers for delivering environmental benefits. So the sort of public money for public goods approach that Matt mentioned earlier. So paying farmers to you know deliver stuff like carbon sequestration, you know, habitat and species management, other things like improving air quality, soil health, and reducing flood risk and things like that. Um, and they've hinted at you know farms having to undertake sustainable farm reviews. Um, to help inform management options and actions um, and inform payments under the new scheme. Um, so undertaking an assessment of, of sort of what currently exists on the farm in terms of habitat and wildlife, uh, I think is likely to have to form a major component uh, of the future scheme. Um, so it'll be important to know what we have on our farms. And as Matt said, you know, if 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 we can't manage what we don't measure. Um, and the Welsh Government have also suggested that there'll be more focus on farmers undertaking self-monitoring um, to, to demonstrate how our actions um, help deliver uh, environmental benefits. So an increased 
knowledge of, of habitat and species identification you know, is likely to make this process uh, much smoother. Um, I think from, from a personal perspective, you know, I think that developing that greater understanding of what wildlife we have on our farms, you know, it, make, it makes me in a way more engaged with how our farming system and, and land use approaches, uh, how they affect biodiversity. Um, and I think it also adds, uh, adds a dimension to, to your day's work on the farm, I think. Um, you know, there's so much pleasure in hearing and seeing wildlife on the farm, you know, particularly over the next couple of months now as so wildflowers and migratory birds signal the start of spring. Um, you know, I, I recorded a, a pair of crossbills on the farm for the first time ever last year. Uh, you know, and that was just fantastic. You know, the joy that that gives you is uh, immeasurable, really. Um, and just from that mental health side of things as well, um, you know, farming can be a lonely job at times, you know, working long hours often by yourself. I think observing the wildlife around you, uh, it makes me certainly feel, feel a bit less alone and that you're part of something bigger. Uh, and I think farming has a huge role to play in looking after wildlife uh, and our birds. And, you know, we should really feel proud uh, of what we do. Um, so I will um, I will end on that note, but I'll I will I will go to the questions. Um, that's all right, Matt. You've answered um, a couple um, of questions in the in the in the chat. Uh, but just to expand, there was a question on what percentage of the lowland farm needs to go into bird seed uh, and other agri environment schemes options for for that to be. Sort of, uh, to make a difference, if you like, so I don't know if you want to have a go. Yeah. No, I can do, yeah. So some work has already been done on that um, for previous schemes and things like that. And, and it was basically what used to be the equivalent, oh, well, over in England, of like a mid-tier compared to a higher tier, um, was that about 4 to 5% of the farm would look to be going into these type of measures. Um, and that would be four to five percent would be required to maintain current populations rather than them continuing to decline. And then actually, if you wanted to actually go that step further and increase those populations, what the kind of measurements that were then was kind of six to seven percent. Um, but the key with that as well is it wasn't just kind of one type. Uh, it's looking at providing what we were talking about before. So those um, year round needs, really. And so that was looking at kind of nesting habitat. So that might only be maybe 2% of the farm. And I think, you know, if most people were to um, measure all of their hedgerows and all of those kind of scrubby areas and woodlands and things like that, they, they might find that they're up to that kind of 2% already. Um, although some might find they need to put a, a bit more across. And then obviously you're looking at kind of 2% or 2 to 3% of the, the insect um, rich habitat. And then also kind of 2 to 3% of the, the overwintering habitat as well. So it's not loads and loads and one thing i'd say as well is um in wales what has happened before with glass deer is that it stipulated um it had to be the mix had to be 80 percent cereals so to me that's just an annual crop i wouldn't want something going into the second year with only 20 percent of the mix um so you're only ever going to provide for that one winter and obviously you've got the full establishment cost of just one season then but that crop i was talking about before that included the kale in there as well as i said there's there's multiple benefits as well as just for farmland birds uh, so fantastic for uh, pollinators come the spring this summer fantastic for soil health especially i'll admit you know on the on the organic farm we had to plow it in just to try and keep on top of that the weed burden but on the uh, on the conventional farm there it was just a case of spraying the grass off and direct drilling so there was no uh, plowing there there was no releasing carbon from plowing and then those species um, within that mix are all quite deep rooting so it's quite good for soil health um, but then also you get as i was saying before you get that benefit of the insect rich habitat so you're almost kind of sorry to say killing two birds with one stone <laughs> if, you, if you see what i mean um by providing yeah, yeah i know yeah i did think twice but um about having you know one area that provides all of those things really so in terms of efficiency of what we can give over to wildlife alongside our 
productive farming is something like a wild bird seed mix is absolutely fantastic and again you know as you mentioned even if you know it's uh spring some cereal again really important for lapwing really important for skylark as well um so I, you know from, from my mind and i know it's an oversimplified way of looking at it but if we can get these options within the next scheme and get them paying properly i think you know if most farms could take up a bit of this then that connectivity across the landscape would be absolutely fantastic but you know as we've mentioned we've gone away from mixed farming most farms now look no longer have the required machinery etc are using contractors if they need to put these kind of things in so the cost or the payment should reflect that and it shouldn't just be uh you know a cost incurred income for gone it should be an incentive on top of that and it should be a realistic costing because for me although um the wild bird seed mixes were included as i said previously in last year the take up was just woeful to be honest and you know i said to many people supplementary feeding is actually included in last year there's a capital works item in last year um advanced but you know, the amount of people that didn't even know that or have a clue. So I think making people more aware of these options, making us as farmers more aware of these options. So when it comes down to, you know, someone coming out and telling us about things, because we can ask, we say, well, you know, can I do this and can I do that? Can I do these things that I know makes a big, big difference? So certainly from my point of view, getting people to focus on options like this would be really key, really. And it ticks off an awful lot of species, as I was saying before, it's not just one or two. And, uh, you know, uh, we had mentioned bullfinches before. I have to agree with her, one of my favourites. Um, and the cover crop I, I showed a video of before, there was four pairs of bullfinches in that, in that cover crop. And bullfinches is a funny one that in different parts of the country, they will visit feeders, but in many parts they won't. And it seems to be a bit of a learned behaviour. But actually, they were going into the cover crop and feeding in the cover crop. It was just fantastic to see. So... And it's just one example of a, a species that benefits. Uh, there are a few more questions, I think, as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go through them. Just, just on, on things yeah. that my take home from there, Matt, really is, um, you know, that, that nature really thrives on on diversity, doesn't it? And we need that sort of diversity in, in the it. landscape. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 100%. There's um, echoing like going a... on. Has everyone oh. else still got mute? It might just be between Reese and I, because both of our mics are on, and we're sure. But I was going to say as well, it's not just about, I know it's a big farm and bird count, but things like the brown hare has declined by 95% in Wales, but again, really loves a mixed farm, in, like landscape. So, you know, and, and we were talking about, you know, predator control in the chat before, but it isn't just birds, again, that benefit from that. So brown hare is something that, you know, goes increases dramatically with a bit of fox control or... Um, water vole you know responds to mint control and things like this so um we're not just talking about birds we can talk about wildlife in general as well just to go through some of the questions uh, yeah, yeah. from ben um we have probably more pheasants than any other bird on the farm uh, that migrates over from the neighboring shoots yeah. and they put another ten thousand down this year uh and they nail all that wild bird seed mix so is there is there a, any responsibility for, for gamekeepers to, to to stop too many released birds? Yeah, definitely. It's um definitely is it's a good question there. And as I mentioned before, you know, we have got an increased kind of population of predators in the UK, and that's something that is kind of really topical at the moment, is numbers of pheasants being released. And um, there's been a, a study done by the RSPB and the BTO that showed a correlation between areas of kind of high release and numbers of predators. But what I wanted to make the point on before with that is that actually that's not so black and white. And there are many, many variables for the reasons of, of our high kind of predator numbers. And, and one of them is type of agriculture as well. You know, we saw in Wales our numbers of crows go through the roof back in the 70s when we had um, payment, you know, headage payments. Um, and what that did was reduce the sword height of grass and, and increase the availability of foraging for crows and, and they rocketed up. Whereas I'd say probably in Wales, it's only been last maybe 10 or 15 years, the, the dramatic increase in, in bird numbers being put down. Um, what I would say to that one in particular for that location and, and what we've got to remember is there's kind of good and bad to every sector. So 
Um, the first thing I'd say is that through the research that the GWCT has done, we have shown that a well-managed shoot and, and good game management can deliver a net gain to biodiversity. So in that instance, actually having game management on site should, in theory, how you should have more wildlife because of that than, than, um, than having a shoot, uh, not having a shoot on site, I should say. But then it becomes a question of making sure that we are looking at good game management. And really what we're talking about there, all those pheasants migrating off the ground, it, it seems from this one anyway, where the shoot is, onto somewhere else. It sounds like there's ideal habitat elsewhere, but not potentially not on, on the shoot itself. So those gamekeepers, as was mentioned there, should be putting in everything that those birds need. And actually, from what has been said about all those birds wandering off the shoot's ground onto somewhere else, that's the keeper's worst nightmare. They want all their birds on their ground. So really, you know, they should be providing that fantastic habitat. And then we talk about that, um, the numbers of predators and things like that. There's been some, it's an area of research that's ongoing at the moment, but the initial results are finding that, you know, in areas where those shoots are, that the fox numbers are reduced and the crow numbers are reduced because of good game management. It's unfortunately where you might get lazy game management that's trying to you know, cut corners and things like that, where the predation control is not done at the right time of year to benefit everything else. So there was a question in the chat before about when to do it and, and, and so forth. I think I answered that in, in, the, in, the in the conversation. But what we don't want is people just controlling their foxes just when they're worried about their pheasants turning up on their shooting. You know, the birds going to wood and doing a bit of fox control just before. What we actually want is reducing fox numbers before the breeding season in the spring so that it benefits all those wild birds too. So really complicated stuff. And uh, I'm the first to admit that it's not all kind of black and white and, and not all perfect either. But, you know, that's part of my job is, is increasing standards across the board and, and trying to get everyone to, to improve that good game management and work towards that. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say something on that is, like Matt mentioned, um, it's a gamekeeper's worst nightmare if they escape and they do go around calling them in, pulling them in. And at the end of the season, obviously they're legally obliged to call them it all back in and dispatch of them at the end of the season. Um, what you also have to remember is the term fair game comes from escaped pheasants. So you, it is within your rights to, if you think you have too many pheasants on your own land, eating your wild bird seed mix, you are allowed to manage them yourself. Um, to, and another question um, from Rachel, uh, more about the sort of policy side of things. Will payments definitely be single farm only, um, or is it worth campaigning for collective arrangements to improve connectivity? Um, so, so on that, I think absolutely. I think so. Nature and wildlife they don't adhere to to farm boundaries. Do they? They 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 kind of use, you know, a wide territory for feeding, breeding, nesting. Um, and if we can pool our resources together as farmers, um, you know, it, 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 it multiplies our, our efforts and, and I think yields greater, uh, greater benefits. So following the same principle, really, on the farm, we've been working with nine or ten different farms in the catchment area here, but looking at sort of natural flood defence um, and improving water quality. So working on that catchment scale with um, sort of Donny National Park, we've been sort of blocking... Um, ditches in the peatland, creating pools, um, creating networks of, of hedgerows on our farms. It's great if you do it on, on your individual farm, but if you if you do that across, you know, a dozen farms in, in a locality, then obviously it's got it's going to be having a massive effect. And I think from a bird life as well, Pian, I don't know whether you want to reflect on on some of the projects that you've been working on. I know you've been working closely with the, the Twite Recovery Project that worked at that sort of landscape scale. I don't know whether you whether there are the lessons to be learned there that you want to share. Sorry, I was a little bit distracted by the cats. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It, yeah. So sorry. Groups of farmers. Yeah. So luckily, the SMS project, a sustainable management scheme project in Wales, have provided some good examples where groups of farmers have got together. Um, and provided um, work together for nature. 
it's not as easy as it sounds. You've got to like your neighbours. You've got to trust your neighbours. You've got to have maybe share a bank account with them. Um, someone's got to be responsible for the admin and the paper side of things. So may, maybe one of them is, is good on a computer. Um, so obviously, there are lots of hurdles for groups of farmers to work together, but it's definitely the way forwards. Like there's no point uh, spending public money on one farm doing something good for nature when the surrounding 20 neighbours is doing nothing. You're just creating an island and it's a waste of taxpayers' money. So yeah, that farmer might think, well done me, pat on my back, but actually um, wildlife, whether it's a butterfly, a bird, a flower, they need much larger area than what one individual farm can provide. Whereas if you work together, someone can provide the nesting place, someone can provide the feeding place, someone can provide the wintering place. You're not responsible for everything if you work in a group. It's also that kind of connectivity across the landscape, isn't it? That's vital. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think in terms of future schemes, uh, they're certainly looking both in England and Wales at the kind of the higher levels of those schemes being targeted at, at groups working together at the landscape level and just to blow the the GWCT's own, own trumpet although it wasn't me individually but um, the facilitation fund that's available in England came from the, the farmer clusters um, and that farmer cluster concept that the GWCT created is now something like 115 farmer clusters across England and then obviously the sustainable management schemes in Wales so certainly yeah that that landscape level work and as Rianne said it's not easy it can be very very difficult but when it's it's done right that the, the things that it can produce are just absolutely fantastic and amazing so um certainly the way that things are working with policy and future schemes is going to be concentrated i think on you know higher payments for those ones that are working together and it, it just really makes sense doesn't it like um Rianne was saying about just one farm doing it and not the rest of them doing it and the simple way of looking at that is from uh, like the catchment level like you were saying Reese. You know, if one farm is doing everything they can to improve the water quality and the farm downstream of them isn't doing anything at all, then what's the point, really? So, yeah, um, everyone can see why that makes sense, really. Uh, did it, did it, did it look we actually the... missed a question, Reese, but I yeah, think yeah. the person has left who asked it. Um, it was about spraying grass off. Um, yes, oh, there's a big go. Yeah, hilltop. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Well, and I think they've left, but we can still answer it, I think. Yeah, yeah. So what's the question? Um, is, yeah, spraying grass off, um, is that something that has harmful to nature too? Um, I think it's yeah, instead yeah, no, it's of ploughing. In, in response to what I was saying, instead of ploughing and, and direct drilling. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, it's certainly not all straightforward, is it? And there's no kind of, with these things, there's no 100% right option and 100% wrong option and no silver bullet unfortunately but um, I think that when you look at kind of soil health soil erosion and all those kind of things I think that um, you know glyphosate has got its place if, if used uh, responsibly um, and certainly if we're to use like in, in arable areas go towards min till I think spraying is, is essential really in that type of scenario so yeah of course responsible use um, but I think sometimes those kind of slight negatives um, are worthwhile to a point because of all the positives like the, the carbon capture and improving the, the soil quality. And then you think of all that life underneath the soil or the microbes and everything like that that benefit from that, all the earthworms and then and so on and so on up the food chain, really. So I appreciate it's not perfect, but um, yeah, it's, it's sometimes... Uh, the lesser evil, if you like. I, I think we've gone through all the questions. Um, not sure if there there are any more. If if you want to ask a question, um, now is your chance to do so uh, and raise your hand. But there's a nice one actually. I was just going to say from um, <coughs> Hilltop Farm mentioned obviously dead pheasants and and agree. Um, you know. Ideally, keepers shouldn't be releasing. If you look at the code of good shooting practice, shouldn't be uh, release having release and release pens right next to roads, and shouldn't be feeding um, pheasants right next to roads, and so on. And they said about creeper feeders within agriculture, and, and I think the overall message is it's a landscape that we've created favours predators, and, and it and it certainly does. But on the flip side of that, it's a landscape that we've created to feed a nation, isn't it? So again, with nothing being perfect, 
it's how can we manage all of these things to try and recreate if you like that balance really so again it's just i think it is just recognizing that that nothing is perfect but trying to make the best of it and as often and in every situation that we can really absolutely i think it's it's been a really um like fascinating evening um and i'm yeah I'm, I'm so glad to see so many so many people in attendance really um it's great yeah. to see so many sort of farmers uh landowners interested in this field um it's something it's an area sort of where i think advice and policy hasn't um hasn't been that strong uh perhaps in the past but i think you kind know, of working with the likes of like farming connect in wales will be really important going going forward um i know that they've started to offer as you say matt um biodiversity audits etc um and ramping up that advice on, on biodiversity and and, and uh, nature conservation so I would um, I would um, implore everyone to to check check those services out. Um, but thank you very thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I'll just just plug the network. Um, uh, it, it's free to join the network. Um, I'm, I, I can see that there are lots of our members are here this evening. Um, but um, if you want to know a bit more about the Nature Friendly Family Network, visit our, our website. Um, uh, and it's free to join. Um, and it, we really appreciate your, your, your support, really, in, in, in strengthening the voice of, of nature friendly farmers uh, in Wales and across the UK. Um, and I see Rianne has, has uh, left a couple of comments in the chat about some uh, useful resources for further reading. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Stop it, I caught you on a session. Ah, 